Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramp. I'm here to talk to you about a lot of things happening, uh, news in Missoula, news in the nation, just a lot of different things happening, some events that are happening tonight and this weekend, along with some of your uh, favorite uh, segments like Pre-Critic and your City Council Report. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. We're going to kick things off with a video of J Mayor John Engen um, celebrating his fifth term and thanking constituents and uh, m you, Missoula, for electing him in uh in his term uh thanks to all uh who participated in our municipal election last week um doesn't matter whether you voted for me or the other person the fact that you voted is a big deal and i am grateful to you the fact that uh a majority of you voted for me makes me even more grateful and i am delighted to have the opportunity to continue this service with you i'd like to congratulate uh, the newly elected and re-elected folks and uh, offer my appreciation to the folks who ran ran hard um, and were willing to uh, step up to their community to do a difficult job and for the folks who, um, who didn't face election thank you for doing the work all right so that was mayor john engen uh celebrating his uh fifth term on council which begins uh, the 1st of January, we have a couple new members on the City Council as well. All right, let's talk about some national news going on here. That $1.2 trillion infrastructure package passed last week. And, you know, a little bit more part of this is was like it originally started out as like a $10 trillion package, but was supposed to be actually take place within 10 years. Um, and so this one's supposed to basically fix a lot of the roads and a lot of the stuff going on here. Roads, bridges, uh, power infrastructure, uh, including grid authority, passenger and freight trains, broadband, I broadband infrastructure. That was one of the big things going on there as well. But the biggest thing is $109 billion, uh, one-tenth or a little bit, uh, around one-tenth of this whole entire budget's going towards infrastructure in roads and stuff like that. And uh, resilience, uh, they're going to be spending $47 billion on preparing infrastructure for impacts of climate change, such as uh, floods and other extreme weather events and cyber attacks, as well as a $25 billion for airports, environmental uh, re uh, remed remedies of $21 billion, uh, creation of, of infrastructure financing authority focusing on clean transportation and clean energy is $20 billion. And so this is supposed to be kind of like the big thing uh, that kind of got uh, whittled down to the one point trillion dollar deal, and so a lot there was it was very unclear exactly what this is going to be all about. But in terms of funding, uh, the Repub the Republican part were the ones that drafted the means of how uh, we are going to pay for this uh, through uh, improved tax enforcement, uh, the net increase of one hundred billion dollars after forty billion invested in the inf enforcement. Irish will be able to follow up on making those who don't pay pay their fair share of their taxes using eighty billion dollars of un use COVID relief since a good chunk of that was related to very specific programs to help with staying in homes and such related to COVID. Uh, reinstating Superfund fees, which is small but important. Superfund is a program in which um, they basically say, uh, you know, like former mining operations or uh, constructions, actually, like when the company leaves, it's like they're still forced to pay their fair share, not necessarily, even though you know, it would be nice if they cleaned it up. But regardless of that, hazardous waste sites was originally financed, and this can be thirteen billion dollars. So it's not. It's 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 going to be it's going to be a chunk of money for sure. Lots of money from the U.S. assets like oil oil reserves is going to be sixteen billion dollars in uh, six billion dollars in sales. And so you know, you can look at this through the. Uh, uh, Faxbox, uh, Reuters.com. That's where I got a lot of this uh, number information as well. The next push is for social spending plan, which will be a part of the reconciliation, which would require 50% of the vote and no filibuster. Um, but uh, any sign of leverage on social spending programs went out the window when progressive Dems caved on infrastructure. Many of these items that got uh, these politicians elected were not on the floor, and we overall we will see how uh, the uh, the people react in the 2022 election. Even after all that's done, the U.S. will also have to deal with lifting the debt ceiling or default on all their debts resulting in a government shutdown. Uh, it'll be the first time we've ever f defaulted on our debts. We just keep on uh, pushing the lines a little bit further back. And so it's something that's on the, uh, th the back of the minds of our uh, elected officials. While everyone is worried about building back better in national scale, Montana is uh, basically officially divided the map into two congressional districts. Um, and I'm just going to show you the the pick as well and uh here is oh here it is okay so this is the a, a good representation of how they're going to deviate the, the district as well uh the darker pink is uh, the definitely you know the eastern part of montana and uh one of the big things with this is that uh 
uh, Helen Independent record uh, reported that the news district will heavily favor conservative districts in both western and eastern regions, with many Democrats worried about getting representation in the U.S. Congress. Uh, I showed the map last week, and most Montana leans more Republican than Democrat in a lot of ways, with the new western district favor favoring Republicans by seven uh, percent. The, the eastern district, uh, sol uh, solidly Republican, was never part of the discussion about making sure districts were uh, competitively drawn. So, as you can see, you know, regardless of your leaning, Montana has uh, remained uh, conservative, and any chance Dems winning would require a conservative view that reaches across the aisle and uh, not just Missoula, just so you guys know. Wake up, Missoula. Uh, speaking of Missoula, we're in the middle of a tax hike, results in higher costs of living and housing prices. Um, uh, not, not necessarily, th th like, there's a lot of things going on there with that. Sorry about peaking audio, but um, uh, Missoula Current did an article, Growth Changes in Missoula's North Side Get Mixed Reviews from Long-Time Residents. Of course, I have a little gripe with uh, them, uh, the way that they uh, mentioned the... Uh, um, the uh, TDS uh, cable company. Uh, this is like, oh, uh, it awards a franchise of $62 uh, million in Missoula. It's like, no, no, Missoula's not giving them money. It, the whole article was about, like, yeah, it, it was kind of, it was pretty whack how they uh, categorized that thing. If you look into a little bit more, uh, it basically allows another cable company to come to Missoula and they're going to be investing that, like, $42 million into Missoula, putting in fiber and basically going toe to toe with Spectrum. And it's going to be two cable companies in the city of Missoula who will use the franchise. Uh, okay, so so far we're talking about the north side. Hey, and the north side has been rezoned. They've been showing a lot of maps here and there. And I actually am going to talk about this a little bit in the city council, but just a little taste. Here's the map of what they're going to do with that new development where they uh, were able to have uh, more affordable housing. In the middle, you can see uh, kind of like a courtyard, more green area. They want to improve this area as well. Scott Street is on the right side of this area that's more in the white. And uh, yeah, this is kind of what they have plans for the north side. But they're also really talking about those townhouses and a lot of, a lot of stuff even further north of that area and so um, it's it's getting more and more scarce and there's a lot more density uh, the city of Missoula is creating those shopping districts uh, kind of like it often sh Silver Park off Wyoming Street for Monday City Council meeting I mean prices are high uh, selling seems way too easy for residents at this time while well, renters have their own problems coming up with the uh, eviction moratorium th that is closing that's close to ending after that weird situation of Congress uh, just over the summer just kind of forgetting about the poor people, just pressing the snooze button until they have to work on it again. But it's on the back of a lot of people's minds who are afraid of being evicted. Um, uh, townhouses have increased by 146 in the, la in the last decade compared to 2011, which only saw 20. Uh, townhouses have a lot of exemptions as well. It's a, a per state law to uh, be able to have uh, be it be built fa uh, faster homes and faster developments and have certain eg exemptions. I mean, I mean, um, townhouses are starter homes, high density and small yards. Maybe you get a twin s 10 square foot yard if you're lucky, but the cost ranges now from uh, 389,000 to uh, 478 thousand dollars for a single family home. And those aren't uh, with townhouses. It's kind of ridiculous just how much they're getting more and more expensive. One of my neighbors, is, uh, um, I live in a townhouse too. I'll uh, and one of my neighbors who lives in the townhouse as well, like uh, the property value when I got it was like just above two hundred thousand dollars, but now it's like kind of ridiculous, like three hundred fifty. I think they get sold it for about three hundred ninety thousand dollars for one of their townhouses. It's it's gonna it's definitely getting really kind of crazy out there for sure. But the north side neighborhood sells on the uh, proximity of the downtown area, which it's probably gonna see some major price hikes as well. But yet has businesses that people can actually get to. So my, my, a lot of people, even in the north side, I've talked to people there as well. Is like a lot of their gripe is like they need to be able to have like better amenities just on the north side, like just be able to walk and create a community space just to like and actually go to like a store or a cafe or something where they don't actually have to drive across the bridge and have that suburban mindset that, you know, that we, we've been kind of co-opting since like the 1950s. Um, I suggest you just check out this article on Missoula Current. It always gets my blood boiling, but this, uh, but the inflated, the inflated costs people uh, I mean, the cracks are starting to show, and there's not a lot of local jobs to sustain housing, renters, or new homeowners, unless they're uh, poor in California but rich in Montana. Uh, but they don't actually have to be from Montana. It's 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 very interesting. It's like it's very cheap to live in Missoula if you come from a place like those big cities in California. But 
All right, so let's talk about uh, some of the things uh, Missoula schools have a timeline to consider lifting the mask ma moratorium in the schools. So one of the things that Superintendent Rob uh, Watson spoke in the um, Board of Trustees meeting for the school board, uh, I believe it was last Tuesday, um, and they were talking about the mask discussion, and they will, uh, uh, basically the whole idea is that they're going to be talking about talking about uh, whether or not they're going to remove the masks in January. That, of course, depends on the numbers of of that of COVID cases being low and how many of the kids have been vaccinated since it's uh it's about that time where uh the FDA and the CDC approved now uh five to eleven year olds being able to get vaccinated I already knew a couple people who vaccinated their kids so far it's been over a year since the first rounds of vaccine can you believe it it's uh it was like the emergency use uh for nurses uh first care workers and then of course you know you have 65 and older pre-existing conditions and then you get 55 and older and then they started opening a little bit more to more adults and then uh it was about a half a year or so into it when they were able to be like oh yeah 12 to 18 year olds and so that kind of really saw a little uh the numbers really dive down but then as soon as we started going back into the school year we started seeing some more hikes but i looked at recently and i noticed that the numbers were kind of uh going down we were seeing high uh, average numbers but i'm seeing it's around in the 60s this week so other than that we'll just have to wait and see how the uh, schools react and um yeah up next we do have an interview with spectrum discovery center Direct, oh, uh, you, um, Spectrum Discovery Area S Director Jesse Herbert Minnie talking about a fundraiser that they're hosting starting off today, and it's going to be an online auction. Um, uh, I'll put uh, provide links. Um, uh, uh, I provided links on the video. So without further ado, here is uh, Jesse Herbert Minnie. Hi everyone. We're here with Jesse Herbert Minnie. She is the director of Spectrum Discovery Area here in the library, <laughs> and on Sunday we're, they're doing a silent auction, online auction to uh, help. Uh, raise money for the kids and continuation of their programs, providing free um, services for uh, not only Missoula, but area around Montana, right? Yeah. And to provide STEM, hands-on education, and role models. Yes, yep. yeah, we are having our Big Night Fundraiser, uh, an online auction that opens this Friday and runs until November 19th. Uh, there's a lot of really fun auction items, awesome experiences, and really cool baskets from local businesses in Missoula. A lot of really fun things um, at all sorts of different price points for people. Uh, the auction closes on Friday, November 19th. Um, on Friday, the 19th, we're also hosting a big night open house. So up on the fourth floor of the library, families can come uh, to see, see our beautiful home, stop by and say hi, see the auction items in person. We'll have some live science demos and, and just a fun celebratory end to our fundraiser. And you guys have a lot of great exhibits up there. Like the first one that almost popped into my mind, I, I went up there just wandering, walking through, I'm just like, is that a giant light bright? It and, is. And it, it was just like, it just like, it struck me. It was just like, I was like, Ah, these are for kids. <laughs> this is one of our new exhibits, the Pixel Pegs. It's like, it's so popular. It's one of our favorites. It will be up on the fourth floor uh, for our big night open house. Uh, and just a lot of fun. Yeah, every dollar raised during big night supports our Science for All scholarship fund, which, like you said, yeah. provides free STEM experiences for kids both in the library and across the state. Yep. And I noticed that you also mentioned like Ravelli County and like free transportation. Yes, yeah, we, um, well, we do a lot of programs on in the Bitterroot Valley and on the Flathead Reservation that Science for All supports. And uh, Science for All also supports free field trips. So that can be the field trip fee for school groups or the bus fee for schools that need support for busing. Wow. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about how people can uh, donate or also the other silent auction as well. Yes. So you can, right now, everything is happening online. So it'll open on Friday. You can, you can donate on our website on GiveSmart. It's bignight2021.givesmart.com. And uh, you can bid on items. You can donate directly. You can purchase a family membership, which supports Spectrum as well. And you can also buy really fun raffle tickets. Mm. So we have a really amazing wine basket donated by Blackfoot Communications. Uh, and we have a really fun package for a Spectrum free birthday party uh, membership and some really cool science goodies. And all the raffle tickets are just $5 each or five for 20. So um, I know that I, I'll be excited hopefully to win a raffle prize. Nice. Yeah. 
Um, we have a lot of really great sponsors for Big Night this year. Yep. ATG is our presenting sponsor. Oh. Uh, a lot of amazing support that is coming from the community. And uh, we invite everybody to, to participate. Well, awesome. Well, thanks for joining me. Oh, yeah. is there anything else you wanted to say? Because I uh, think that wraps everything up. I think that's great. I mean, we hope to see everybody participating online uh, and, and come join us for the open house. From, it's from 3 to 6 p.m. on the 19th. Uh, on the fourth floor of the library. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. Jesse. Yeah, thank you, Scott. All right. Hey, guys, welcome back. Uh, sorry about the audio in the beginning part. That was a little weird. Um, yeah, so, okay, so we're back on it right now. So we're going to talk some pre critic. We're pre judging a movie based on, uh, kind of like based on barely anything. So we're kicking things off with a movie about Tom Hanks uh, doing his uh, Tom Hanks in a movie where he's Tom Hanks. All right, you blink and you miss this movie about a post-apocalyptic Earth and the will to survive and provide a robot companion for a dog. Dog lovers, mo uh, mo uh, dog lovers move aside because Wilson finally speaks back to castaway star Tom Hanks, whose dying wish is to go cross-country tour of our great nation before he dies from being human in an environment that does not support humans anymore. Remember when the end of the world was about aliens or robots taking over and not something that w about us ruining the environment well we live in different time this isn't this is like san andreas or whatever and this next one we have uh bruce willis does a movie about an old man trying to live the same career as charles bronson old man action flicks saying ladies i'm badass Please do the bedroom thing with me. I follow the FCC guidelines. Basically, this is the movie about the hunters becoming the hunted um, movie called Apex. Bruce Willis, guaranteed tough guy, good guy, uh, um, gruff, whatever, will fight off sci-fi hunters in a planet or island or wherever he lives alone in peace. Uh, when did Bruce Willis become the dealless action guy? Up next, we also have In a Vein of Billy Elliot Jumping Boy Over a Title. Uh, comes uh, Belfast. We see a poor family in the 1960s in Ireland and a boy's ability to imagine a better world in his head. While he's having fun being a kid, his family struggles to make ends meet. This is all during the Irish civil uprising that would last from 1960s to the late 90s when they kind of just agreed to having Northern Ireland in the Commonwealth of the British Empire. It's a black and white, so it's artsy. Uh, then finally, yes, we have a fourth one for you guys. We don't have uh, plenty for a speed round, but I'm going to talk as fast as possible. Night Riders, dystopian feature about a family push to join a vigilante's group to survive. Somehow, children are taken away from their families and must join a state-run boarding school called the Academy to gaslight them into being state-issued citizens. Anyways, a reflection of the militarized education system hell-bent on taking kids away from their families and gaslighting them into soldiers. Not sure if this has anything to do with our current education system. Wink, wink. Uh, movies tend to take things to one extreme over another for entertainment value. Up next, we have a sprite animation for you guys. And it is, uh, yeah, I just made a sprite animation and I didn't do a dub and stuff. I will have one for next week, I hope, but I think this was fun. So without further ado, here is my sprite animation. And when I come back, we can talk about some city council. So don't look for deeper meaning. It's not like the uh, inevitability of the folly of man. Or it could be. Whatever. All right, moving on. Let's talk about some city council. Kicking things off is public comment. Tyler uh, Steinbach, who works with homeless folks, talks about those not able to access resources with emergency warming shelter this winter. We've had some concerns brought to us at our board meetings and public comment um, regarding the warming shelter policies as far as who's 
being kept out of the facility and there's some medical concerns that aren't being considered by the current process and that's the agencies aren't being involved in like the decision making as far as who's allowed to stay there or not that would know that information okay so one of the things uh you know just a little bit of background on like you know what what's what's what, what you know the pov policies are is so far the paul Varel center has a policy of not many individuals who are intoxicated or under influence or have been uh and they have been running this dry shelter leaving some folks out in the code a cold as a result and there's also a lot of issues in terms of like people who have been banned from the paul Varel center for um you know, where, where the police had to be called on them and stuff like that. But they uh, also the bigger issue is with the COVID and um, them following the CDC guidelines of having limited space in their uh, Pavarello Center. And then the emergency warming shelter is to uh, admit the folks as well. But a lot of the things in the changes this year is that they're having some more securities put in place. And Steinbach has addressed uh, the State Behavior Health Board to look into further this from last Wednesday for those who suffer just not on the outside, but on the inside as well. Um, up next, we have a public hearing. Uh, three times a year, the Affordable Housing Trust does an overview. Last time I spoke about this, uh, they spent over 26000 of their $300,000 on United Way of Missoula for a centralized housing solution fund going towards helping over 70 people pay the rent in Missoula. But their biggest request comes from three applicants that have a total of 445000 including the uh, United Way of Missoula, and they went over budget. But they pitched their idea to the Missoula, and this is all informational only. So uh, Habitat for Humanity would have taken the largest chunk at $300,000, while the other two were the $27,000 for the United Way. And then, of course, the 119000 for the Hogan House LLC geared towards senior living. Fixed income reduced uh, utility costs. So Emily harris uh addresses some of those uh, concerns and why they chose uh, United Way over these other two and the scoring committee voted on the three scenarios and ultimately did not recommend the remaining two projects because of concerns about project design, feasibility, and impact and outcomes of the requested investment. The scoring committee discussed the importance of being good stewards of public funds while balancing that with the demands and realities of our current housing market. Okay, so part of this uh, had a lot to do with uh, uh, keeping up uh, with, uh, you know, keeping their uh, their money in the housing trust and, and and finding ways to have bigger impacts. And one of the things uh, that really kind of would have been hard to do is that in terms of like even construction costs and Habitat for Humanities, they would have required some, you know, purchases of, you know, uh, supplies and equipment to make this thing happen. And so $300,000 to them would have been more of a donation than an actual uh, feasible plan, and then of course the Hogan House, which geared towards senior living, that might have, uh, but you know, those aren't necessarily costs that will be, um, I in terms of the scale, it's like, yes, it's good that the money would be going towards that, but they want to make sure that the money can uh, put in real change in the Missoula uh, community as well. So that's why they pulled back on those two, uh, and then they kept the United Way one. Uh, they want to be able to help more as many people as they can with the limited resources of the $300,000 through the Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, so up next, we have the Wyoming Street Silver Park area is looking to create a kind of like a, a new kind of, it's not necessarily too much shopping as it is more just like kind of cafes, kind of like taverns, and just kind of have like a restaurant's cafes with uh, cabaret licenses as well. Um, and so Associate Planner Emily Glucken talks a little bit more about this and kind of shows uh, the map of this area and kind of gives you a rundown. So tonight specifically, we are talking about subdistrict B slash C. Um, and that's the location of the proposed amendment that we're discussing this evening. It is bordered by subdistrict H to the north, H-1 to the east, and H-2 to the west. Um, and all of these are parks and open space districts. Um, and then it is bordered by subdistrict B to the south across Wyoming, um, which is a primarily residential district with some commercial uses allowed. Okay, so I just wanted to mention as well, if you look at this map, H right here is where they're going to continue the park, and you have the trail right there next to the river, and then further down here you have, uh, you know, uh, the parking area where you can get access to the park, and then you have this kind of like uh, more of these areas. I'm just trying to give you a scope of things, because this is the, the railroad track that goes above, just as you go in Wyoming Street, and you can see all these houses that are already made, and then have this area as well that they're going to basically be creating more of what they have on the south side of the uh, 
of the Wyoming street. So it's a continuation, but they also want to be able to have more mixed uh, commercial businesses they want put in place here as well. Um, the, as cities grow, the zoning can change and how, the, the, how the city can manipulate the types of growth in the area, but don't affect design standards in residential, mixed commercial, and in industrial, where industrial zoning is uh, kind of relegated to towards the train tracks in Missoula, but in, you know, north side kind of uh, rezoned in those areas. So they, that's why they have all that development kind of popping up as, as well. So uh, one of the things also I wanted to mention is that, like I, like I mentioned before, is that Missoula Current did a story um, on the TDS cable franchise. And one of the things that kind of like, just kind of like, hmm, that didn't, the, the, the headline didn't really match what actually happened in that meeting. And I wanted to kind of uh, talk a little bit more about that, is that TD, TDS cable wanted to move to Missoula and start business and do direct competition. So they all they, they have to ask the city of Missoula for a franchise because the city of Missoula kind of owns the right of way cable lines, kind of like owning like a side like the sidewalk is owned by the city and it's on the people who live next to the sidewalk to clean up. Regardless of that, uh, they want to uh, invest forty million dollars in putting in fiber. Uh, connections and being able to hook up to the cable system as well as being able to provide uh, phone service, internet, and of course, cable television. Mr. Zilkern did a headline that was kind of believed that the city gave them the money, but in terms it was the complete opposite. The headline, if you read it, it like it's supposed to ca catch you into doing it as well. Just stay with the boring stuff. And, and, and here's Gwen Jones, and she reflects on the tedious uh, cable franchise that the city awarded officially on Monday cable franchises in 12 other states. They've got um, assets. They, they basically are positioned to do this. So in my mind, it's, it's, it's reasonable to award it, but also I think it would be good to have some competition here in Missoula for our cable franchises. So, Okay, so that was just the reaction of uh, Gwen Jones, one of the city council members, talking about just, you know, uh, being able to have that kind of stuff, TDS cable company, to use the right-of-way cable infrastructure that the city authorizes. Up next, we got Public Works, and this is the kind of like the big kind of topic on there, and then and this is probably gonna get you guys mad as well, but it also got me kind of uh, miffed as well, is that they're looking to increase the uh, the water rates. So every month we're gonna be seeing uh, ever increase of the water rates. Last year, the big thing was that they're uh, compiling sewer, stormwater, and water all together in one ticket price. You've seen your, pr uh, you're basically, I'm paying like $42.99 uh, a month for my water bill, and then Effectively, January 1st, it's gonna, the monthly bill is going to increase by $3.22, and then in addition uh, to $4.43, effective January 1st, 2023, and then the next year it would be another $4.74. That's $12.39 increases within three years. Uh, in three years. So John Ingen talks about the importance of this increase and how if, uh, if the city of Missoula didn't own the water company, we'd see a lot higher numbers in the rates. The beauty of public ownership of these utilities is that, uh, is that you make the decisions around the way this utility operates with the advice of your professional staff, uh, and you are directly uh, tied to the residents we serve. Um, and you also uh, most likely use the service. Uh, if you don't, you're probably thirsty. So what you'll hear today is, uh, is uh, a comprehensive overview of the reasons that we're making additional investment in the facilities that we use every day. Uh, we will continue to maintain our rates at uh, a remarkably reasonable level, given uh, the level of service, given uh, uh, the amount of uh, infrastructure investment still necessary for uh, our water system um, staff has been making tremendous progress uh, since our acquisition and what you'll see today reflected in uh, the request for uh, additional revenue is uh, continued investment in improving that system. We made a commitment upon purchase to ensure that uh, we would temper leakage and we're making great progress there, but it's an expensive proposition. What a price to pay. All right, moving on. Uh, so they talk a little bit more about this. They bring in Jeremy Keene, and not just water, but wastewater and sewer part of this monthly payments, like I said before. Uh, Jeremy Keene, Public Works staff, talks a little bit more about this as well. But historically, we've not kept up with replacement needs with infrastructure um, in these utilities. This is not unusual. It's happening all around the country. We're, we're relying on infrastructure that's well past its intended life. And our folks do a great job of keeping that stuff running but uh, we need to accelerate our replacement program in order to avoid 
more costly emergencies and disruptions in the system. And we need to invest in new technology, things that will make us more efficient and more sustainable in the way we run the system. The, okay. the second problem is increasing costs, and we're seeing that in labor, in materials, and energy. Um, we rely on, on skilled, experienced operators to run these systems, and we need to make sure we're able to, to pay those positions to attract the talent we need. Um, and, and the systems require materials and power to run, and those costs are things we don't have a lot of control over. Um, you might have heard this morning that we saw a CPI uh, increase of about 6% this year, um, but that's not really a new trend. Um, we've seen uh, steady increases in places like healthcare, um, insurance, and things like that for, for quite a few years. So um, we have to make sure that we're, we're keeping up with those costs. Hey, you know, if the costs of health and all that other stuff are going up, why can't we just put our water bill up as well? Sorry, that was, uh, I'm still a little bit miffed on, on, the, on the prospect of why the justification of that comment, but the system as a whole is flawed and as owners, yes, we own it because we have a responsibility and uh, we uh, acquired a broken system from um, um, eminent domain through uh, a lawsuit that we filed against uh, uh, Carlisle Group. There's a whole pretty good story about uh, uh, about them now buying up trailer parks on uh, John Oliver. So it's a little it, it hits a little closer to home for sure. But uh, let's talk uh, Logan McGinnis, who is an engineer who has been working with the uh, Missoula Water Company, Mountain Water Company, Liberty Water when it was briefly that, and in all its phases from previous ownership. Talks about how we uh, run compared to other Montana cities, and this is what he had to say. Some of the highest quality drinking water in the state of Montana. The DEQ views us as one of the best operated systems in Montana. Our facilities meet the community's needs for domestic water and fire protection into the foreseeable future. And we do that 24 hours a day, 365 days per year. And customers know that the water from our tap is healthy and that it's rigorously tested by Missoula water staff. A little bit of background on the water rates. So we acquired the water utility from Liberty Utilities in 2017 and today we're still charging rates that are lower than they were in 2011. And we know Liberty was planning to raise rates about 5% per year. The 500 foot oh, buffer. Sorry about that. That was a little too fast on that one. And I'm going to end by saying, I mean, it's a good thing that we're having a water company uh, is, you know, all the money that we actually pay for the water actually goes back into the city rather than lining the pockets of uh, um, hedge funds and all that uh, uh Basically, what's it called? Uh, retention holder uh, holding companies. That's right. Holding companies where they basically own the companies. They could care less about it. They just keep it running on band aids, and then they just sell it to another company, inflated costs, you know, pump and dump kind of deal. And a lot of utilities have been kind of like the center of that. And um, you know, ultimately, the money put into this will go towards the replacement of uh, one pipes per year in the 100-year plan. And so far, they only have been replacing 0.4% in 2021. So they're trying to get to that 1%. That is the sweet spot. And so far, for the 2022 uh, year, uh, they want to do 0.6% for that year. And you know the, the series of rate increases are set for uh, next, uh, starting January, and it's going to go until 2024. And you know we'll we'll just see how it kind of uh, uh, it shakes out. So um, up next, admin and finance. Uh, the city is providing an additional 125,000 for um, uh, from the American Rescue Plan Act uh, funds the uh, to f uh, funds to the Pavarella Center to assist in their efforts to recruit and retain adequate staff and operate the emergency winter shelter 24/7. Other things regarding the Karis uh, Park mound, which removed the dirt. If you remember that mound, it was kind of like a, a, a pretty nice hill. A lot of people would sit on it. Kids would just roll down the hill. Completely gone. They removed it. They're doing a lot of stuff right there. If you drive past it, and I saw a lot of that dirt, they moved it. I don't know if it's still there, but it's in that parking area right next to where the uh, old Fox Theater used to be. They call it the Fox Triangle, um, part, kind of parking area where the uh, hospital staff used to park, but then they moved to Kitty Corner across the street off of uh, Spruce Street. But um, one of the things is that I, uh, I kind of skipped this meeting. You can go back and look at this, but it was a fairly short meeting. But um, and then I talked a little bit more about the Northside neighborhood. And one of the things is that, uh, you know, this is kind of like the map. You can kind of see the area for mixed high density and the use of green space in the central courtyard feel. So far, the city is happy with the development uh, of the side, which is closer to the Scott Street overpass than the other new development and further up currently bu uh, 
being built as well. So um, yeah, and then we're moving on to land use and planning. And so this is one they're continuing to talk about the Wyoming Street and Silver Park rezoning for new business opportunities. This we will also look into. This is the big one, uh, marijuana dispensaries. They're trying to figure out exactly, hey, once uh, Missoula pops off and uh, the legalization of recreational sales in January, um, there's going to be over 60 dispensaries selling recreational marijuana in the city of Missoula. And now they're trying to be like, okay, what are we going to do with all these uh, dispensaries and how are we going to regulate the ones that are here and the ones that may come in uh, starting uh, July 2023 when new businesses and the marijuana dispensaries can uh, be attained. So far, um, Cassie Trippard, uh, Trippard uh, Community Development, exp uh, explains the 500 foot separation between dispensaries. And this is what they're going to be using for uh, buffers as well. So here is Cassie. The 500 foot buffer still leaves available area in permitted zoning districts um, for new businesses while preventing future clustering. Um, and as a note, we've heard there is a bit of confusion about what legal non-conforming means. So any businesses that have already been approved before these regulations are implemented will be able to continue operating at their current licensed address. So if the dispensary moves and a different use comes into that space, then it would lose that non-conforming status. At that point, a new business would not be able to move into the buffer area. And this does not mean a business could move to a different location within the buffer if they're non-conforming. They would only be allowed to stay at their current location or find a new location outside the buffer. And so, uh, oh, and so far, you know, the whole idea behind this is like, oh, the businesses that are already there, the dispensaries that already uh, are getting approval um, through, uh, you know, means of uh, medical marijuana dispensaries and that kind of stuff, because they kind of just started popping off as soon as, uh, um, I think it was about a month's leading up into the legalization, and there's a couple ones that really just kind of like got on the ground floor of actually preparing for that kind of stuff. So a lot of them, they don't have to adhere to the buffer. It's kind of like the whole grandfathered in kind of deal. Um, so it's about being on the ground floor and this existing businesses won't have to worry unless they decide to move. And they also mentioned different sizes of buffers. This That was just one of the examples. And a thousand foot buffer related to schools and churches, but are still trying to not to discourage new business from starting. Then again, they had a 750, a 750 foot buffer, which downtown, as it stated, would be at capacity. But if they use the thousand foot buffer, it would only allow a maximum of, a maximum of three dispensaries in the downtown area, which, you know, three dispensaries is still a quite a bit of time, but also it would also favor the downtown businesses because if you actually think about it, it's not given fair advantage to uh, new businesses as well moving forward. So, um, and one of the things they also talked about was the 30% uh, glazing um, minimum requirement for uh, window storefronts. So that was one of the things that they really kind of talked about in, in length. I didn't want to talk too much about it. It just kind of feel like it was just like, oh, this is kind of like a footnote to what they're really talking about. But the next to topic is the dispensaries. Not, not necessarily the dispensaries of giving the, uh, the, medic uh, the, the recreational uh, pot to people in Missoula, but also the, uh, where they grow it. So the grow operations and how much power is going to be taken there. So Spencer Stark, with permitting for the city of Missoula, talks a little bit more about this as well. Uh, presented regarding cannabis manufacturing and the proposed general manufacturing designation. Um, it's been brought to our attention that there are a range of methods for extracting cannabis that may result in a broad range of impacts. In addition, there are similar uses that are permitted in more zoning districts than the proposed cannabis manufacturing classification would permit. Staff is currently following up with uh, our fire department to get feedback regarding the broad range of potential health and safety impacts and whether a more lenient classification would be appropriate or cause any concerns. Staff may propose to change cannabis uh, manufacturing to a limited manufacturing use. Um, and if our research shows that this is, a, uh, this is appropriate, then we'll issue a, a memo amending the recommendation um, within the coming week. Okay, so that's kind of like uh, like one of the bigger things as well is the energy. So um, they also brought in somebody, uh, uh, Lee uh, Ratterman, and one of the things that they're talking about, uh, they were talking about energy conservation, explaining the increase of energy used to cultivate and just grow growing operations. And so it's not greenhouses, it's actually just like internal like warehouse, but like they have to create a climate controlled uh, area to be able to grow these things. And it costs a lot of money just to uh, be able to do the power and being able to grow these operations. So I'm gonna show you a chart and um, sh um, Lee's gonna uh, explain a little bit more, but just try to look towards the bottom. It might look a little fuzzy on the screen, but you can see that uh, the area in which they're talking about is uh, very high. 
lots of data out there that shows that a cannabis cultivation facility uses between eight and 10 times the amount of a normal um, kind of, I guess, quote unquote, normal office building. Um, and then this is in, in direct comparison to some large energy using industries like uh, metal manufacturing, paper manufacturing. And you can see that red line at the bottom is you know, very significant in comparison. So, oh, sorry about that. I thought the quote was a little bit long, but it was not. So, I mean, there's quite a ticket price for energy, and most of these sites, from what I remember, require some kinds of greenhouse control climate to even grow this stuff. Um, this ain't wine, people. Uh, the Missoula uh, Climate Smart people are also reaching out to these groups to help uh, mitigate the energy consumptions. The staff recommends the use of power not to exceed 36 watts per square foot per planning board's five to one recommendation vote um public hearing is scheduled for monday november 15th so they're going to be talking about this and they'll have it uh, open for a week so if you have public comment they're going to open up on monday and they're going to do a uh, final consideration the week after but it seems to be kind of uh but so far uh it does favor those who are were on the ground floor to have the advantage over new businesses but at the same time if you really think about it if uh the legalization never would have happened those businesses would have just kind of tanked so it was quite a risk on them as well moving forward but a risk that looks like it's going to be paying off as soon as january hits because they're basically going to have a year and a half of uh competition amongst themselves before new businesses start popping up and missoula is definitely uh going to see a lot of businesses popping up in missoula for sure um um cassie trippard ta about again talks about how the city can regulate the amount of these businesses as uh, as we go forward. So I haven't been able to see exactly what the total capacity for number of businesses would be if we had a blank slate, but the um, buffer does create sort of a de facto cap because there is a finite amount of commercial or properly zoned space that could allow dispensaries and staff rather than going for the cap where we did see the numbers were all over the place and it's hard to pinpoint exactly how many can be supported in town we really are focusing on the idea that people should have a diverse use of mixes in their neighborhoods so if you can only walk to one commercial area where near your house um, you should be able to go to a mix of services that serve your everyday needs which can't happen if it's oversaturating so whereas a cap is just a cap for the whole city and they can be located everywhere we thought this got um, toward sort of an equity piece and that people should have that mix of uses and to spread them out across the city so they don't concentrate. Okay, so th I mean, there's just a lot of uh, businesses that are going to be popping up for sure. And, and so far, all, uh, all your city count council items, Thursday was Veterans Day. Um, I just want to give a shout out to uh, a lot of the various events that were happening. It was snowing on Thursday. Uh, can you believe it? It was definitely... Uh, it was just like, oh, it's only trying to snow. And then it was like, oh, okay, it's full-blown snowing. Didn't really stick to the street, which is good. So it was kind of a nice kind of snowy day. But uh, those, of, uh, those of you who went out for Veterans Day, because uh, they usually do the courthouse statue, the, Do the Doughboy statue, which was erected in 1927. Along with that includes the Vietnam Memorial in Rose Park, Missoula Cemetery's veteran section. And we cannot forget to the location of the university near the journalism building. Uh, just a quick shout out to veterans and those who stood out in the snow the other day. Uh, there And there is an El Nino coming up this winter uh, up here in the Rockies so prepare for a very wet pr possibly pretty big snowy uh, winter time this r time around and of course for more information you can look at uh, the weather but as always you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us it is a wonderful website for you guys to check out and more up next we have an art clip featuring uh, Jody Leitner I premiered it last week but I'm going I'm going to show it once again this week and then when I come back we're going to talk about some events
Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some events that are kicking off this week as well. Like I, uh, like I said in the interview before, sorry if there was a, uh, a problem with the beginning part of the interview. Spectrum Discovery Center is kicking off their au silent auction online, but also you can donate directly to them. You, all you got to go to is uh, spectrumdiscoveryarea.umt.edu. You can find out more information by going to MozillaEvents.net with the uh, plug-in for the event, which kicks uh, their big night event is uh, going to happen next Friday, and they're going to have events at the public library, and they're going to have some uh, hors d'oeuvres and drinks over on the fourth floor. You guys can check that out, um, and you'll be on the Missoula Public Library's calendar. You can go to MissoulaPublicLibrary.org for more information. All right, and speaking of, of Missoula Public Library, we have a lot of events happening as well, and including the Can the Cats uh, food drive and this donation is going through November 20th and Missoula Food Bank and Community Center also they have a drop off here at the public library you can't miss it it's right there in the center of the main floor uh, Can the Cats food drive is back again this year now through the December 20th donate food and funds to help Can the ca MSU Bobcats you can donate here in the library you can bring your cans to non-perishables to the main floor near the ma uh, maker space now in the 22nd year the annual Can the Cats food drive is a friendly off-field food drive competition between UM and the Missoula community and MSU and the Bozeman community to see who can raise the most food and funds for our local communities. All donations collected in the Missoula area during these two week food drive uh, competitions stay local and help stock the shelves at Missoula Food Bank and Community Center at the University of Montana Food Pantry. Uh, da -da -da -da. And the library ha hosts Tiny Tales and Storytime at 10.30 a.m. in the program room and the art room. Um, it is a great way for kids to get in, um, engaged with books. It's uh, geared towards the younger kids, um, and they want to do some get their bodies active and do some uh, songs and um, plays and all sorts of stuff like that. Watercolor and yarns, for those of you who want to do some painting watercolor at noon today in the public library on the fourth floor, uh, just ask around and you'll know they'll point you in the right direction. Hands-on Science, Alien Spectrum Discovery Center has events that goes from Wednesday through Saturday, uh, kicking things off around 10 a.m. to about 6 p.m. Um, join Spectrum for guided science activities and discovery events from 2 to 6. Oh, 2 to 6 through uh, Saturday. This week's theme is Aliens. No registration required. Spectrum Discovery is open for all visitors of all ages to explore science through engagement exhibits and activities. It's on the second floor. All the kids' stuff is on the second floor here at the library. It's a wonderful location for a lot of kids to engage with learning, books, science, and more. Donate with the DJs at All Missoula Albertsons. All Missoula Albertsons is part of Can the Cats. So if you go to any of the uh, Albertsons in town um, from now until next week actually just today at starting at 3 p.m djs from kiss fm alt 101.5 107.5 zoo fm 96 3 96.3 uh, the blaze and news talk kvgo will all be at missoula albertson's location to collect a few donations for can the cats swing by albertson's between three and six while well you do all your shopping all that stuff and more uh, all together now uh, it's not just uh, us coming together for can the cats but it's also a musical uh show that's happening at the MCT Center for Performing Arts, Musical Theater International, all together now, a global event celebrating local theater in exclu uh, an exclusive musical review featuring uh, songs from Broadway's beloved shows from Disney's classic fairy tales to well-known Broadway uh, mainstays. It's, a, it's, a, it's basically a cabaret show of all your favorite Broadway Tony award-winning hits. The Friday f uh, night fundraiser begins at 6 p.m. tonight, and the event... Uh, it's basically going to happen this weekend as well, so you guys can check that out. Uh, no parking in the parking lot if you are library staff. Um, <laughs> wow Audio Showcase, fundraiser for the literary podcast Words Out West. Zootown Arts Community Center is doing events. Sorry, my nose is itchy. Uh, Words Out West, Montana's nonprofit literary podcast presents Wow Audio Showcase and fundraiser offering poetry, fiction, nonfiction, and theatrical readings as well as music from selected WOW writers and performers. The social hour begins at 6.30 p.m. features book signings and even WOW authors uh, with beer and wine available to the Zach's Bar. I can't say WOW without sounding a little bit louder. Uh, Uncle Funk, I'm assuming he's going to be playing some funk music at the Union Club tonight at 9 p.m. Saturday events, the Ultimate Craft Fair. Ooh, kicking things off with some more craft fair. This is a big deal because the university always has w one of the best craft fairs around. University Center Ballroom, third floor of the UC Center, otherwise known as the University Center Center. Ultimate Craft Fair hosted by the Missoulian. Get your holiday shopping in the craft fair. Shop local produce, goods, and for all over Missoula. They probably have, like, 
fun gift baskets, plenty of candles, uh <coughs> and, and that's going to start at 9 a.m., and it's going to be at the uh, third floor of the university ballroom. Free car seat checkups, uh, MISA Training Center, so Missoula Emergency Center has a uh, 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 certified car seat installation technicians ready to make sure your little ones are safe. <laughs> Drop-in car seats installations, this is from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the MESI Training Center located at 1220 Burlington Avenue, Avenue in Missoula, Montana. Uh, Missoula Emergency Service is proud to team up with Safe Kids. Kf Safe Kids Missoula, led by FCH, Buckle Up Montana Coalition, Montana slash Granite County, Missoula Public Health, Missoula Rural Fire District, and uh, Frenchtown Rural Fire Districts offering services to Missoula and surrounding areas. Strutting for Stuffin, fun run. So, hey, as you guys are getting gearing up for the Thanksgiving, it's a fun time to do a fun run uh, to just get prepared to uh, work out, work off some of those carbs before you uh, start shoving them down your throat this Thanksgiving, uh, 11 a.m. at the Bella Vista Pavilion in Fort Missoula. Um, and that's the huge pavilion. You can't miss it. Uh, s teen Open Studio at Missoula Art Museum. So Missoula Art Museum is hosting a weekly event. This is great for kids who are artists. They provide the supplies. They also have snacks. MCAT doesn't even provide snacks for your kids. They provide snacks, and this is from 12 to 3 p.m., um, and they will uh, be open work for uh, teens with free art supplies and space to work. It's a great program, and they've been starting to do this, and I think it's going to really kick off. Saturday drop-ins, 1 p.m., Missoula Community Media Resource here in this studio. We're going to be having some stop animation for the kids. we also been trying to implement some iPad stuff, so if your kid is wanting to do some... Um, iPad drawing, Apple pens, that kind of stuff. Apple pencil, sorry. Uh, <laughs> they can do uh, some youth events geared towards youths of age 8 to about 14 years old. We have a mix uh, soup of kids different ages, but uh, we are only able to work, uh, be able to have a limit of about 6, 7 kids at a time. A lot of kids uh, are really pretty bad about working together, so we're only able to help out uh, six individual kids at a time. So um, first come, first serve. It runs weekly from 1 to 3 p.m., no RSVP. Mm -hmm. um, also Saturday night, they're doing another ski movie with MSEF and Goal Ski Presents Roots. Uh, Faction's third feature film uncovers the foundation of uh, free skiing as seen by the current generation of skiers from the caves and the uh, dolomites to the nightscapes of the Ruka and the mythic peaks surrounding uh, Verbriers. Roots take us on the journey through the vibrant spectrum of free skiing. Um, that's going to be playing at the uh, near Animals. It's Goal Ski and Snowboard, a business near Animals. Um, and that's off of uh, Broadway. Uh, JJ Gray and Morpho, Mo Mofro, sorry, it's going to be some blues music at the Wilma happening Saturday night. Zootown Arts is also doing another show with Sugar Colt, Crypto Collider, Rob Travolta at the Zootown Arts Community Center. They played uh, during the uh, sol social distancing session, and their video is uh, available on the Zach's uh, YouTube, so you can kind of see what they're doing as well. And yeah, it's going to be some great stuff there. And the workers is going to be at the Union Club. They're going to be some jam band going to be playing at the Union Club on Saturday night. So it looks like they're going to have a, a full weekend. And every Saturday, uh, the Badlander is going to be hosting Chris Moon. So if you're interested in club, house music, that kind of stuff, uh, Saturday night's the night for you guys. All right. Like I said, um, and uh, with that interview with uh, Jesse Herbert Many from the director of Spectrum, uh, th they're doing a area big night fundraiser. Each night, the big night brings together a community to raise money for Spectrum Science for all funds, which helps ensure that every child in the community can get access to an inspirational role model and hands-on STEM activities and experiences. Our silent auction begins uh, today, and it ends on the 19th at 5.30 p.m., so you can... Uh, bid and do all the stuff online as well. You can go to spectrum.umt.edu uh, for more information as well. You can also Google Spectrum Discovery Area. KBJ Pay It Forward. MCAT's going to be live streaming this event. It starts at 7 p.m. the Zootown Arts Community Center. Um, and this is teamed up with the P Play It Forward, a music series and podcast program curated to unite and uplift community artists and organizations in Missoula in conjunction with KBGA College Radio. So it's a great thing. We've done this a couple times. And it's great that we're going to be doing it again with them. And it's going to be live stream on our MCAT.org local live channel, but also the Zach's Facebook and YouTube channel as well. Heartless Bastards is going to be playing at the Wilma. Um, and you'd have to be heartless to skip out on the Zach. Um, Logjam presents a, a Welcome to Heartless Bastards in live and concert performance at the Wilma November 14th. Uh, 2021, uh, if you want to be more specific, and tickets go on sale. Uh, tickets already went on sale. It's already on there, blah, 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 all that stuff. So they're going to be playing on Sunday night, 
p at 7 p.m. So those are your events. And if you want more information, go to uh, uh, MissoulaEvents.net. Sorry, I was going to say the city council. But you can go to the city council website if you want to. It's up to you. But anyways, this is your uh, source for everything that's happening in Missoula, events and more. And they have highlighted events happening as well. All right. So that pretty much does it for my morning show. I want to thank you guys for joining me and for Wake Up Missoula. As always, I'm Scott Ramp.